I've seen it with my kids already, all the stuff that came with them when they moved in. I have three for three blank family trees from preschools because, you know, what do you, who, who do you put where? What do you put where? And, oh, let's just tuck it in the backpack. So, you know, there's a transition there that is yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. But it is an incredible thing to do, and there are so many kids out there that just need somebody they just need somebody to step up and and try just try i'm kelty mcguire and you're listening to the kids are child free podcast hello and welcome to the kids are child free podcast today's conversation is one that i have been wanting to have for some time now and that is of course we know that you can become a parent through different ways we have focused thus far on people choosing to have biological children but Adoption is another wonderful way in which we can step into and say yes to parenthood should we decide to go down that path. And when I saw that my old high school friend, Liz Leedham Pepin, that her and her wife had adopted twins in the last year, I thought, there is our perfect first guest to bring us an adoption story. So today you will be hearing from Liz. You'll hear all about her life, how she made this decision to adopt, what it's been like adopting four now five-year-old twins. You'll hear about the third child that will soon be joining her family and everything that you might want answered about adoption and what that process has been like, at least within the Canadian system, which you will hear that Liz is from Canada. And of course, please know that today's conversation is anecdotal in the sense that it can't be representative of everyone's experience and all of our adoption systems globally. Um, But it's certainly going to give you a good taste of what you might be able to consider and explore should you decide to go down the path and decide to adopt. So without further ado, I bring to the podcast, Liz Leedham Pepin. Liz, we will get right to it. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. And I just want to tell you again that after connecting with you, reconnecting with you a few weeks ago, um, I, I just, I was in like the most brilliant mood. I was so happy that after and this is going to make us sound old, although we're not, right? <laughs> no. After I think 24 years, you and I reconnected and I was overjoyed to see both like all the incredible things that you have done with your life. Of course, most recently and most notably now having adopted, uh, we'll say almost three children, which we'll, we'll hear about in a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, also just how you're, you have that same brilliant smile for people who are not watching the video. Liz, just like radiates and emanates this beautiful joy, um, that that is something that hasn't changed. So our, our conversation really warmed my heart. Uh, Aww. and yeah, I went like great right on Instagram stories after I was like, I just connected, reconnected with one of my Aww. high school friends. It was so beautiful. And I'm going to bring her on the podcast. So, um, all, all my ramblings aside, I would love for you to tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into your story. Yeah, of course. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's, you know, definitely a new thing for me, but quite exciting at the same time. Um, So yeah, me, I live with my wife, Amelie, in the South Okanagan in British Columbia in Canada. It's a pretty beautiful spot. True. Um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nice and hot in the summers. Um, Yeah, I work as a nurse, registered nurse at a clinic, a community clinic. It kind of wears two hats. So Monday to Friday, we do, um, we're basically a family doctor's office for people struggling with moderate to severe mental health and addictions problems. Um, And then after hours and weekends, we're like a step down emergency clinic. So it's kind of nice to do, you know, two very different things out of the same building. Um, So that's what I do for work. I've recently, like you said, been on an extended leave, mat leave. So it's been very weird not working first time in my life. And I'm on the fence with whether I liked it or not. Like, obviously, I've loved getting to know my children. Uh, But it's been hard not being that working person and using my brain in that way. I'm sure there's a lot of people that can resonate with that, I'm sure. But yeah, so yeah, we kind of live here in our little bubble. And prior to kids, we were avid rock climbers. Like that's how we met years ago, which is really quite special. Um, So yeah, we 
love the outdoors, spend a lot of time in the mountains, and then we adopted some children and everything changed. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about all that and some of these changes <laughs> that you've been navigating. Liz, tell me, I'm curious, did you always want to have children? Has this been a long time dream of yours? <sighs> you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Right back from like my first memories, honestly, as a young, young girl, I would envision being pregnant. Not so much having the children part, but just being pregnant and going through childbirth. I've always been just wanting it so bad. Um, it's funny how life goes. So first little curveball, you know, realizing I am gay. So that makes okay. it a little bit yeah. more tricky to naturally have a child. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, years ago when I was in a pretty serious relationship, um, with a girl out on the East Coast, mm -hmm. we were trying to get pregnant. We were going to start a family. And so out uh, in Halifax, the way you have to do it is go through the fertility clinic. Okay. So on our very first appointment, sat down with the doctor, hadn't met her yet. And the first thing she told me was that I was never going to be able to have children. The only route for wow. me would be IVF, and even then it probably won't work. And I remember sitting there, like she hadn't even opened up the file yet. And I was like, what just happened? Like my whole life just crashed in front of me. I don't have the emotions to process, and now I have to sit through this meeting of my fertility and how it's not going to work. So it was probably the most devastating thing that's happened in my life so far. And wow. took about a year. So, you know, we tried for a year intrauterine mm -hmm. insemination. And honestly, like looking back, it was probably my darkest time for sure, just because it was constant monthly failure. And I couldn't understand why my body wasn't doing what, mm -hmm. uh, like for eons women's bodies can do so yeah it kind of took like the kids thing took a bit of a halt there just because it was so bitter in my yeah. soul yeah um and f you know the relationship dissolved so obviously mm. things you know shouldn't have happened and I needed to learn that about myself and so that was a really good piece in hindsight but wow hard to get through in the moment especially okay. coupled with doing my uh, neonatal uh intensive care rotation in nursing school so Halifax has like the big hospital for sick kids mm -hmm. and my goodness, just being paired with, you know, babies that are in dire circumstances because yes. of choices of parents or whatever, and me not being able, like, it was just so very difficult, you yeah. know, to have those two paralleled experiences and, and still have to be that professional, compassionate person. So yeah, long story short, took a bit of a hiatus in that mm. dream. And uh, didn't really think of it much over the next few years. I met a new partner and she had a six-year-old son. And I was like, okay, okay, instant family. This is what I've needed. <laughs> like, this were, is Were it. you happy about that? Like the, Initially, the son? Initially, yeah. it was a huge selling point. Like it was something that, you know, I had buried, but knew mm -hmm. wasn't gone. You know, deep yeah. down, it, that desire and draw was still there. So yeah, we were together for two years. And through that time, funny enough, I had another big turn of thinking where um, just our relationship was quite problematic with just not seeing eye to eye on very mm -hmm. important morals and values, especially with child rearing. And since I wasn't, you know, the parent from the start, yeah. um, I didn't have much say and was told I didn't have say. So I got to a point where I was like, nope parenting isn't for me like I'm not I'm not a mom so that was an interesting thing and then I really tabled it I really did okay. I didn't think about it really much at all other than I was like well I'm getting older and my life is really easy and nice and a little bit boring <laughs> despite all your adventures <laughs> yeah because I'm like I'm doing all the things I want I have a great job and you know yeah. very fortunately can do the activities I want you know so yeah. I was just like well I can live out my days with my lovely wife and carry mm. on 
But funny enough, my brother, um, who's younger than me but lives out in Fredericton now with his family, um, he was pregnant with his wife and they had their second, well, my brother's second daughter. Okay. Um, so I went out to visit her and my goodness, what a cutie little pie. But it was in the moment. I was putting her to bed and feeding her her bottle and just that connection with the eyes like it was honestly an epiphany moment and I left that room after putting her down and I was rocked completely wow. went down to talk to my brother and I was like it's weird like I think I need to be a mom and he's like you do you do need to be a mom and then started the conversation that like I'll never forget my brother and his wife offered to be a surrogate which is immensely amazing um we didn't take them up on that but like wow yeah. what an offer um and I came home from that trip and I was like okay honey I've got some big news to share and I hope you're on board and lo and behold of course she was we're nicely on the same page often and she absolutely was and we started the adoption process the very next day okay lots to talk about here. So mm -hmm. just out of curiosity, okay, okay, okay. A few different things. I mean, when you had been doing the IUI process then, was that your partner at the time who was doing that? Okay. So for you, it was like, me. It was, it was you. Me doing okay. It. Okay. But it wasn't successful. And so it was, it was at the end of that process. And the doctor said like, listen, this isn't going to be feasible for you. You know, it was the beginning that she okay. basically led with that. Um, looking back, it was a private clinic that made their profits off of certain procedures. So, mm. you know, I wonder if it was just in her best interest to try to sell the most expensive thing. However, I never did get pregnant. So yeah. I don't know. And, you know, I did try for over a year. Yeah. So, okay. you know, there is something there. But yeah, yeah. It, it was definitely me. And right off the get go, I was told zero chance. Okay. Yeah. And I got the impression it was at the beginning, but I wanted to clarify because then you mm. mentioned like a year of treatments. Okay. And then so, and I mean, incredible that your brother and his wife were like, we'll, we'll do this with you. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll be surrogates for you. Had you even talked to your wife at that point? Or was that like an invitation that was made? Okay. So you, you don't even know if you're going to do this, but at, at this point, then it sounds like you personally had shelved the idea of kids. It was still in the back of your mind, but it felt like a, it wasn't something that would be possible and B, it maybe wasn't even something that you wanted anymore. Had you and your wife talked about having kids together and what was that conversation like? And then how, yeah. how, how did it go to then like flip things on its head? Yeah. You know, it was interesting because we talked mostly around kind of our past struggles with the grief of loss. So me with my, you know, hardships over that year trying and then mm -hmm. Amelie also had tried to get pregnant in the past with the past partner and she okay. had a pretty late term miscarriage, which you know, was her grieving moment yeah. in her childcare process so, or wanting children process. So yeah. it just, you know, we kind of spoke like we had this, you know, equal dream that just didn't happen, but maybe we could, we always talked about fostering because I've okay. always wanted to foster, like working with the teens I did in Halifax. I did that for about 10 years. It just led me to realize how many amazing kids are in the system and just mm. you know what what if kids were given a, a different environment to just live in yeah. um so I always wanted to foster and she was on board with fostering later on in our life mm -hmm. um but we kind of just skirted the topic thinking it just was we were past our time for choosing yeah. that kind of yeah. um so yeah but then that conversation it was almost like we just picked up from what we had just been talking about, which we hadn't been. <laughs> and we were both like on the same page. And she was like, yes. And even to the point where we wanted three. And I know that's going to be one of your questions later, but yeah. we did. We wanted three. Okay. Um, and even in our little kind of paper, um, we said we wanted three plus or minus one. So we could have taken four. We could have. I love, first of all, that we can hear child or children in the background because... Yeah. 
no, this is the reality of having kids. And it's like, this, this will be a memory. This one, this, this podcast with, is it your daughter or son? So it is funny enough. The autistic son that never pays attention. And right now is, here, I'll just give her, he's right beside me. Oh, bless. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. It is, yeah, he's a pretty sweet guy. <laughs> uh, okay, a whole family. All right. Well, well, we're you know that's a spoiler. We're jumping ahead. We are, now we we have, we have an older child here. Um, you've mentioned with autism. We're going to talk about all this. So, right, was it right to adoption then? I mean, you talked about fostering. You'd had this offer from your brother and sister in law, and um, you and Emily said, "Let's let's adopt." Did that connect with your experience then, working with children who were in the foster system previously? Um, I th- they had been in the foster system, yes. correct? Okay. Yes. Or, or how did the seed get planted um, that you, you thought, let's adopt, let's go for this? Yeah, it's funny because I did lead with that offer. When I came home, I did say they did offer this amazing mm-hmm. gift. Um, yeah. But when we were thinking about it, so Amelie's a year older than I mm-hmm. am. I, and, uh, you know, they had just had Millie and they were thinking they wanted another child. So when they offered the surrogacy, it would have been after they had all their children. And so we were looking at about a five-year period minimum, probably, of when we would even start to, you know, look at a baby coming to be. And at that point, I'm like 45, getting on 50, like not unheard of. Yeah. But just for me, I was like, you know, I kind of would want to get this up and running sooner rather than later, yeah. just because like it's a lot and we're already over 40, which isn't bad, but just is a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you, you'd have this epiphany moment, I'm sure, that is yeah. as well. It was like, you know, and of course, there's a lot of people who very much want a child and they have to wait or, or it may not be possible for them in the long term. But to, to have this aha moment or this sort of soul awakening that this is something you really wanted to be able to then go adopt a child and as it will come to be three children, um, you, you pursued that. Okay. So uh, now, first of all, in, in case you missed that, Liz is based in Canada. And so I just want to kind of offer the disclaimer that what we discussed in her experience is related to the Canadian adoption system, correct? Um, and that I, my understanding just top level is this, the system of course is going to look different in different countries. And mm-hmm. so can you just set us up like broadly speaking, the adoption system in Canada, is it Is it not for profit or is there a profit element or how does that work? So there's three different routes for adoption in Canada. You can do like a private adoption where the family member knows the person that wants to take the baby and it just kind of gets done behind the scenes because funny enough, our set of twins has an older set of twins as siblings that were previously adopted as well. Okay. Um, And so they were privately adopted through family. So the ministry that we dealt with had no idea or knowledge of any of what that looked like or who they were in the family. So really no information is shared that way. Um, We we did the public one, which is definitely non-for-profit through Mm -hmm. uh, the Ministry of Child and Protective Services. And then there is another option where... It's also called private, I believe. But anyways, you it, it flips around. So all of a sudden, you're not looking for children and being offered children. It is you put up a profile of you and your spouse, and then you have to get chosen um, mm-hmm. by the birth person, okay. like birth parent for their... And often, they don't have multiples available. Um, yeah. So it's funny. It's like you know, public, you're basically told you likely won't get a baby. So don't ask. Mm -hmm. And that private way, it's like, yeah, you can get a baby, but it's going to be a long wait, likely, because you have to get weighed and get chosen. So and it's expensive, very, very expensive. We I looked into both those routes at the beginning, Mm -hmm. um, because we did kind of want a baby if we could have Mm -hmm. one. But it was so expensive just to apply and they told Mm -hmm. me that at the time they were waitlisting applicants so it was like you pay your fee Mm -hmm. and then you just sit on a waitlist for an unknown amount of time and then you go in the queue to be chosen so it just looked like this mountain of a hope that might not ever work out and so you know that coupled with my past like working with the kids in care Um, I really did want to go through the ministry because that's kind of where I felt those like, not that the other kids don't need 
that helped. Don't get me wrong, but it's yeah. like these are the kids that had a really rough start and mm-hmm. have been, you know, taken from their parents for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and it's it's troublesome. It's problematic for their lives. And so we wanted to give siblings, specifically a group of kids, okay. a place Um, Mm -hmm. to grow up. So have a shared trauma, go through life with that shared trauma of adoption, uh, Mm -hmm. but also be connected to that loving and stable environment. Yeah. You know, you mentioning this, this term trauma of adoption, something that's come on my radar in the last couple of years since doing this work. And I feel it probably shows my ignorance for not having formerly considered it, but I think we often, or you know, broadly speaking, consider adoption as like, oh, it's always this wonderful thing that like children are being given homes that that couples or individuals can get babies. You know, it's kind of like they can go to the store and just pick out this child. And there is a lot of issues to be considering, especially, for example, and and please bear in mind, listeners, that I'm not an expert on this. But if you're looking at like interracial adoptions, of of course, cross-cultural adoptions, like what are the implications for a child or children being raised in a home outside their primary culture or with a different racial background? Um, Of course, these children, to your point, my understanding is that in a perfect scenario, a child would stay with their birth parents or family. That's sort of the the preference. But of course, that's not always possible. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about the scenario with your, your own kids. But what were some of the, I guess, ethical considerations that either you hadn't been previously aware of, or maybe you became aware of through your experience working with kids in care? Yeah, that's a that's a good question for sure. And there's a lot of ethical stuff with adoption, especially like you said, going cross culturally. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the biggest things we talked about right off the bat with our whole adoption process. You have to do a big um, course; it's like multi months okay. long. Okay. Um, so they talk specifically about Indigenous people mm-hmm. here in BC because we were specific to our province. Yeah. And uh, just the statistics of Indigenous people in care, I, I want, I, I'm, it was at well over 50%. I want to mm-hmm. say 70, but I honestly can't remember yeah. exactly. And I don't want to misspeak here, but yeah. um, a lot, most kids in care are Indigenous um, mm-hmm. culturally. Yeah. And so, you know, I, like you, you do talk about how you're going to manage that if you get kids with a cultural background or even religious background that's already instilled. Um, You do have to come up almost like the openness contracts, which we'll talk about. Um, It's almost like that where you have to come up with a plan of how you're going to help your child integrate into the community that they're from. So, Mm -hmm. you know, let's say we did adopt a child from one of the bands or what have you, mm-hmm. we would have to connect with that band and mm-hmm. make, you know, ourselves familiar and well, like hopefully be welcomed and, and be yeah. a part of their community with our child and hopes to like give them that bridge of understanding of where they come from. Cause it's such a huge piece for all children. And I can't yeah. imagine how much more significant it would be for culturally um, different children than, yeah. you know, their caregivers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would be big. And I know with, our last one here, like we're still going through the process, but his biological father was unknown. Um, and so it was interesting that way because the family finding that they do, it, they exhaust family finding on all sides that they can first. That's their first step. And so mm-hmm. when they don't know the father, they kind of try to get hints or any kind of information and so with us we were told that he could have been American like we're quite near the border Um, and so because of that we were looking at if they needed to do family finding across the border it was going to be a minimum of two years of the ministry Mm -hmm. looking into that family to make sure nobody could take that child okay so it is like family finding is the biggest step for them a hundred percent takes a long time 
Yeah. Okay. And so you mentioned something about an open contract. Does that refer to the nature of the adoption being open? And can you just explain a bit about what that entails? Sure. Yeah. So all adoptions um, in Canada are open adoptions now. They didn't used to be. You could choose, you know, uh, (laughs) but they are all open now. And at first I was, you know, not taken aback. Um, because I, I do believe in openness. I do. But it, it right away was that hurdle that I was like, okay, well, we absolutely will be connected to birth families no matter yeah. the situation. So that was an interesting uh, little thing to swallow. Uh, yeah. But basically, it's it's quite benign. Like, So you do all the big paperwork and process. And then the, one of the last things you do is you go in for that openness contract right up. And so when we went in as adoptive parents, the birth, so, so far only the twins birth dad has signed an openness agreement. So he had to go into the ministry offices in his town, sit down with them, and then we had to come agree to it on our mm-hmm. end and si- everybody signed. So what ours looks like is uh, two in-person visits per year and then access to a private Facebook group where we upload okay. photos. Um, and, like, it's that's so easy to do, honestly. Yeah. Like, two yeah. in-person visits a year, that's, you know, as long as they're going well. Um, you know, I have no problem with that. So, you know, even though it was a hard thing at the start, I think it's going to be so valuable, um, when the kids get older and, and start to really wonder, you know, their roots and how important, because going back to the little six-year-old that I was kind of stepmom with for a bit, that was one of the biggest clashes that we had was, he didn't know where he came from, and he always asked. He was always mm. asking me who his dad was, where where his dad lived, and he didn't even know that he was like a sperm donor child. Like he had no okay. clue, um, and his mom didn't want him to know. So that was really hard. And at six years old, I could see that desire to know. So I can't yeah. imagine at 17, 16, when you're really going through it, trying yeah. to figure out who you are as a human, you know, th- that's an important piece, who, where you yeah. came from. Yeah. So openness is super important. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, it's interesting that you bring that up with a sperm donor because I have a guest who um, I think by the time this episode airs, will have been on, um, on the podcast. Her name's Katie Bryan and she's a solo mom by choice. And she talked about, you know, when she first went through this process and used a sperm donor that she really just saw it as like lending DNA, so to speak. But once she actually had her son, who is now three, she really understands the importance of even if this person does not play really any or a big role in a child's life, like they, there, there is at least that opportunity that they could and might and that it is it is more and that relationship, you know, even though it may be in some cases very short lived, really just, for example, like at birth they're starting to realize it has some bearing and there, there is, you, you mentioned, you know, the trauma of adoption, the trauma of being born to a person, being raised by someone else or multiple someone else's, which I know we, we talked about beforehand, like what it means for a child to then be in so many different homes, especially leading up to adoption. So, okay. So, so many different things in different directions we can go. I want to come back to you. So you decide to adopt, you say, you, thank you for sharing, by the way, a bit about like what that process looks like for you individually. Like how long did it take then? And what, what, what did you have to do aside from this course in order to become like, were you approved right away or was that a process to go through? It's funny. It was well over two years. And in fact, we are still waiting for the finalized documents to come from the Supreme Court um, for the twins. So we were told it would be a six month residency period uh, once they were placed that we would test it all out. Social workers come out every month, make sure things are going well. And at the six month period, part they send the documents to the supreme court for um you know justification and verification of the adoption and so we're still waiting it has that's probably been one of the harder things to deal with is the wait times even though you know it's not fast it has yeah. been very difficult so it's the slower proce- than you think <laughs> oh my goodness and you know to no help of the ministry, sadly, they kind of set themselves up for this um, clash of information. So right off the hop, when we applied, we got um, a reach out from the main office in Victoria saying, please watch this video. Um, and it's all about adoption, just so you know what to expect. Mm-hmm. 
they really hammer in right off the bat the fact that you probably won't get a baby and you're likely going to get kids that have significant struggles in whatever realm. Yeah. So in that video, it specifically said, you know, if you're willing to adopt out of the high importance group, so kids with high needs, older children, or sibling groups, they would fall into an expedited um, category that the process would take anywhere from six months to a year. So we heard that and we were like, oh my goodness, like six months to a year and we could have children in our house. That's so much faster than we thought. Mm -hmm. So we kind of sadly got our hopes up for that timeline yeah. and very quickly that just got shredded to pieces. Um, but that's okay. It is what it is. So <laughs> it was just a lot of waiting, a lot of waiting to hear from social workers at the start, mm -hmm. um, not knowing who was going to call and when. Mm -hmm. um, and then that course took a few months. It was online. It was quite tedious, mm -hmm. um, important. Don't get me wrong. It, yeah. it did hold a lot of important information, especially for people that did not have a background in child and youth studies, which thankfully I did. So maybe that was why it was a little bit, you know, harder for me to get through. But um, it was a long, long course. And then we couldn't start our home study um, until we were done the course. So okay. that took forever. <laughs> and then finally, we were almost done the course. And lo and behold, we were told like, Oh, just finish the course. And you'll wait, you'll hear from someone. We're just like, oh, Yeah, okay, we'll just wait for months again. But we ended up hearing from our district social workers, like before we even finished our co course, which was extremely exciting. Yeah. Um, but then the home visits, wow, were they ever interesting to go through. So they do anywhere from five to eight, we were told, okay. um, of, and usually one a week. So that gives you an idea of time frame. And it is intensive interviewing. So everything from, you know, our very intimate practices as a couple to wow. our trauma history um, to our the way we want to parent to the safety of our house to my dog's vaccinations like honestly it was every single okay. category okay. every single category yeah. and hours on end so you know we were told oh you guys are prime candidates like a nurse a landscape person like great people you guys will have five visits so we had 10 we had 10 wow. visits um, because our social worker had some issues with some of my trauma in my 16th year um, mm -hmm. that she needed to talk to my mother about, which is very funny. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you shared some of this when we talked last time. And I, you know, I it, it's it's good. I mean, these children deserve to have the most, uh, the best home possible with people who are really able to care for them and I, I do have to, I'm curious about the relevance of some of the questioning for sure. I mean, when you mentioned like our, our intimate relations, I'm thinking like who, I mean, nobody asks us that, right? Like it's so, so bizarre. And, and should that be reason? I, I, I'd be really curious to know what the ideal answer would be yeah. for someone. You know, for I know. At, yeah. It's I, true. I, and even the question that threw me off was what is your level of nakedness in your home? I'm like, hmm. Never thought of that before. <laughs> really compared to what? Yeah. And I mean, of course, the irony is nobody asks birth parents any of these things, um, which, you know, per perhaps I sometimes have thought, and I'm sure you've thought as well, sometimes maybe we, we should have to go through like a readiness or preparedness sort of assessment before we're able to have our own uh, biological children. But yeah, I mean, when you talk about trauma in your 16th year and like how grueling that sort of assessment was, like we all have traumatic experiences. And of course, in order to assess how those have impacted us and then to know that they wanted to talk with your mom, which let's face it, a lot of stuff. I mean, I have a good relationship with my mom, but, but we don't necessarily talk about the ins and outs of my, my past trauma, if you will. So yeah, crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sorry, it, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I agree fully. I, I When she said she had to speak with my mom, I was so taken aback. I was like, well, my mom didn't even know about the second one, so I don't yeah. know. Like, like she obviously knows now, yeah. and I have done lots of therapy. But, yeah, it was just so funny. 
And then I, you know, even advocating for myself. So my trauma was sexual assault times mm -hmm. two. And, you know, now currently I work as a forensic nurse. So I do the very intensive sexual assault exam. So I tried to advocate in the moment. Well, you know, if I was still triggered and yeah. traumatized by my own history, there's no way I could be an effective professional for people going through it in the moment yeah. um, and, and in such an intensive exam. Mm. So uh, you would think that would have been, you know, argument enough, but it was not. My mother yeah. had to be called and I felt 16 once again. <laughs> well, it's so bizarre. I mean, it's a little bit like um, I think about women who want to have um, – Oh gosh, sorry. I'm like losing, like, you know, for example, their tubes tied to not be able to have kids. And it's like, oh, you know, does your husband know? And you need to have a th authority from someone else. It's just like, it, it really, it shows this lack of trust in our own autonomy and independence. I think it's, it's almost, well, if, anyways, I mean, I won't digress, but okay. So, so how many years then was it until you, no, I just, I don't think we mentioned this, but like you've had the twins, so your first two children for how many months now? Just since last spring, correct? Uh, actually last December, December, Ooh. yeah. yeah. Funny I, enough, I turned 41 on December 6th and December 7th they were placed. You became so it a was, mama. Yeah, <laughs> it was just like, what an overshadowed, wonderful birthday present. Wow. Okay, so that, that had been about two years then or was it even longer by the time they came into your home? Oh, probably a year and a half, I want to say, for like all that process. And then, yeah, we're just should be getting that finalized document back within an, the next couple of weeks, but okay. it was, it was a long process. <laughs> no kidding. Okay. So tell us about your kids. I mean, I, th I think you've alluded to it, but you, you've got twins, boy and girl yeah. twins. Tell us a little yeah. bit about the kids. Oh man. It's funny. So they, I was at work one day and so just an aside part of you know, your first steps when you get approved after your home study, now you can start looking at children and it's so weird there's you know not a very up-to-date but in a database that you can mm. scroll photos or not photos but just profiles and so I remember being at work and reading a very quick profile on this four-year-old set of twins and I was like weird I feel a weird connection right now like I just felt weird and in my head I was like did I just read the profile of my future children and so this was quite early on well before we were kind of ready to go and so I asked our social worker about them we only and I asked about these twins specifically and and it led to months of being like no there, there's already couples, you know, you shouldn't look at them. We have so much still to do, you know, get them out of your head. But it was weird. I couldn't, we couldn't, I dreamt of them. My coworkers dreamt of them. Like, and it did. <laughs> yeah, it's the weirdest thing. Oh so when, like, I had a crazy dream and I won't get into it, but it was of a boy with blonde hair. And then my coworker came to work one day and she's like, I had a dream of a girl with fiery red hair and lo and behold our twins are exactly that so Athena bumps yeah Athena has fiery red hair and Aries I don't know if you caught the glimpse of his very white blonde hair but it just it was really weirdly meant to be right from the start and so yeah lo and behold we were ready to go and they were available <laughs> surprise surprise Funny that. Yeah. yeah and so we we put in our this is another piece to adoption that is quite daunting and I could understand why people might want to like not go through past that point and probably why so many people had looked at these twins and not chosen them because basically you're given their medical files and their um, placement history so for us it was for massive massive binders these two twins were born extremely premature at 22 weeks and six days now when I learned that I looked it up and at that time they that, they were only three days away from yeah. the world record of earliest surviving twins like it just blew my mind at that alone how early they were born and that they both survived
It's, it's incredible. I mean, you and I talked about this when we spoke the other week and like my nephew was born at, I think, 26 and a half, 27 weeks. And I feel like they had said at the time being born earlier than I think it's either 26 or 25 weeks, there's very low likelihood of survival or if so, then not without severe complications. So, okay. So true miracle babies, they were born so early. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, okay. yeah. So basically, um, Athena had you know, surprisingly a clear slate on her development. She was developing typically and, you know, no real concerns. Aries, on the other hand, right off the bat. So he had physical deformities at birth. He has something called craniosynostosis with his head. His sutures kind of closed up way too early and mm-hmm. caused his brain to grow out the other, basically the other side where it was open. So he was misshapen. Um, So they knew right off the bat that he had medical issues. Um, So cerebral palsy also. And then he was diagnosed with autism and global developmental delay at around three. Um, So this is the thing I was getting to, like you get these binders and what the process is, is you have to read their medical history, take it to your family doctor, have it explained to you. So you really understand what these diagnoses mean and how it could, you know, affect their future. Um, And then you sign off. And so when you sign off on accepting those children, that's you choosing them before you even see them in person, meet them at all, see any videos. Like we had seen nothing. We didn't even really know what they looked like. So that was intense. Like reading everything of such complication and such dire, you know, prognosis for him. He was told he was never going to walk with his cerebral palsy. Like it just, he was... The, the unlucky candidate in that twin duo, for sure. So we know that for so many of us who are on the fence about this decision, that we can grapple with it for a very long time. I was personally going back and forth on whether I wanted to have kids or stay child free for probably close to a decade by the time I really committed myself to making a decision. And when I reached that point, that decision-making point where I realized that this answer is not magically going to appear and that it's something that we need to concretely, consciously decide, it was sort of this moment where it was like, enough is enough already. I am tired of going in circles. I'm tired of the pros and cons lists and hoping the answer will just show up. I'm tired of reading the books or talking about this ad nauseum or discussing it in therapy. And if you relate to this, if you are also at this sort of breaking point with your decision, if you're ready to finally make a decision about whether to have kids or stay child free, I want to invite you to join me for the fall session of my kids or child free group coaching program. This is a three month long program, and we're going to be kicking off the next round in the middle of October. This is for those of you who are on the fence. You're trying to make a decision. Nothing you've been doing has elicited a clear choice. And if you are ready to do something different, I want to invite you to join me as your guide to take you through this process and help you get clear on the right path for you among a group of like-minded women who are also grappling with the same decision. I want to invite you to check out my kids or child free group coaching program. Again, we kick things off in the middle of October and I will link to the details in the show notes of today's episode, which you can also find the information about under the work with me tab over at kids or I I'm super curious to ask, and I, I want to set this up sensitively, but a lot of women, you know, a big fear they have being on the fence when they think about having children, I think, and, and this is of course going to be for, for most people, but you hope to have a child that is born. And, and I want to be clear that the terms I'm using here, this is based on what we see as normative. And I, I, I want to be mindful about that, but, you know, quote unquote, healthy, developmentally normal, you know, not to have behavioral issues or challenges. And I have had many women and men say to me, you know, if I knew that I would have a child with any of these challenges, like, I just, I don't know if I could do it. I don't think I'd want it. And I'm wondering for you, I mean, first of all, did you have reservations? And then second of all, how have you been able to knowingly, because when we, when we birth our own biological child, we don't know. How did you knowingly say yes to taking on what amounts to, I'm sure, major challenges for yourself, your wife, and of course, for your son yeah, and the family? It, it honestly was a 
blind leap off a cliff situation. It was like, I, I don't know how this is going to go, if it's going to be something we can handle or not. But we did it. And, you know, going back to my history of working, like I thankfully had a lot of years working with kids with different developmental uh, disabilities. I definitely did a lot of work with autistic people mm-hmm. and then later with the teens in care. But so I, I knew what those diagnoses meant and what they looked like in reality, even though mm-hmm. autism is just so diverse. Like you can meet four autistic people and they'll all be so different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, there were certain things that we were definitely okay with accepting. That's part of the whole home study part that we had to do was fill out multiple pages of tick boxes of disorders, diseases, history, behavior of what we would be willing to accept and what we wouldn't be. Which is a double-edged sword because if you don't tick off a lot of boxes, they basically say there's no children for you. But if you do tick off a lot of boxes, you get all like all the kids with all the high needs. So it's like, oh boy, what do you do? But we, I read his file and thankfully also I'm a nurse. So I have a really good medical knowledge to me. Mm-hmm. And so I did understand what all his diagnoses meant. And I looked at them. I'm like, they're big on paper, but it's not big in real life. Like these are all manageable things. Um, and so we agree to it, but I for sure understand people that would not want to continue because it is such an unknown and it has such high consequences for your own life too. Like of, you know, maybe your child will never live independently. What are you going to do now? And so it's just something that we just chose to navigate as we go and, you know, funny enough, one of the things we always thought right from the get-go were like, this little Aries angel has everything written down on paper, but watch him be the easiest of the three. And lo and behold, he absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned his sister's quite fiery. <laughs> you know, in a great way, like her personality is strong and independent. She already knows more than most adults, she says. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure she does. <laughs> Oh, and let's point out the fact, I mean, people don't know this listening, but I think if I'm not not mistaken, it's like, what, 6.07 in the morning there? Um, yes, it is. The other kids, I, I maybe they're asleep or with your wife, but like you've got little Aris beside you and he's been playing for the last 30, 40 minutes, very yeah. joyfully from the sounds of things on his own. Yeah. Yeah. He's a super happy guy. Very, like when we first got him, he didn't think he knew anybody was around, animal, item, or person. Like, no recognition of anything. He just spun things on the floor and pushed his basket around and made some noises. But I think it was a few months in, I was, like, bathing him, and he looked at me, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. My soul just shook a little. I feel very seen, like, holy, I okay, now I can't get away with things anymore. (laughs) Like you actually are looking at me and watching me. And then it started the trajectory of just him seeking you out and playing beside you. And he's a very cuddly boy. So he'll often come in and just like sit on your lap and cuddle into your shoulder. He's He's a very interesting kid, for sure. He does have, like, autistic tendencies, his stimming behavior especially. Mm -hmm. But other than that, he's so atypical from the kids that I've met before. And he's honestly blowing his school away. Like, we weren't sure how kindergarten was going to go. We've had lots of meetings in preparation for this. His autism therapist has gone into the school to try to have a seamless transition and teach them how to how to communicate with him, which is easy but hard, <laughs> like not straightforward. Yeah. And just, you know, learn him. And, you know, just the other day, the teacher pulled me aside and she's like, yeah, you just disappeared one moment. And I looked over and he had made a friend and he was playing blocks, turn taking with this little friend for like 20 minutes. She said it brought a tear to their eyes and we're just like, it, it's so wonderful watching him mm. progress because everything was so unknown that this is just like the highest 
icing layer on any cake possible. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I, you know, I, I imagine the challenges can be great, but like the joys and the rewards must be deeper and richer too. in a lot of yeah. ways. They are. They are. It is like that typical saying of like the days are long, but the years are short. Like I've already felt that the days, like I can't believe how, like I've always been a very calm and collected and patient person and how much I've been tested right off the bat with all these kids. Like that's kind of shocked me a bit. Yeah. But it's I'm, like- I'm not surprised. Not, not because of anything <laughs> to do with you. I just like, my goodness, like what a transition and change overnight. You have two children oh. who are, who were at the time four, were they when you adopted them? Yeah. About four and a half, just under. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, maybe, I, I mean, so I have a couple parts to this question. One is what I hear from a lot of women is this fear, this loss of identity piece. And I know you mentioned for you, like you and Amelie had like a really robust life with your adventure and your outdoor hobbies. And for you, you talked about, you said at the beginning of our conversation, some mixed feelings around being off work and like the good and the bad about that. So I'm interested for you, I mean, being really thrust into it with two older children, um, one in particular with high needs. What, what was that like? And how, like, have you felt like you've lost yourself at any point in the last year? And how have you navigated that? Yeah, big, big, that's a big question for sure. And so true. Like, I, I don't know if I would say I've lost myself as I've just kind of put my special hobbies uh, on the side for now while they're young like we've taken Athena out climbing and it's great and it's fun but it's just it's not the climbing that we would do right it's it's altered it's it, it's a lot e- so it's like we kind of knew that was going to happen we could not live the same lifestyle and raise children like that was a given right from the start mm. Um, but it, it, you know, it was something to adapt to because, you know, for me, getting out to that rock wall or getting out for a run at any point on my leisure time was my way of coping and, you know, processing and things like that. And so losing that volume of participation right off the bat was tricky. Amelie and I did put in kind of an agreement that we would, you know, send each other off to do things to like still get that input. Yeah. But it, it you can't get around the fact that it is going to change your life, but it, yeah. it does it in the most miraculous way that you don't really care as much you know because you know it's not gonna go away like it's not like we still have all our climbing gear and you know if grandpa's willing to look after the three we'll go you know no problem but it's like right now our focus has shifted to the kids and you know much like I'm sure lots of parents feel like all of a sudden those great moments of oh, I just did that really hard climb and it was, you know, I tore up my skin, but here I am at the top replaced with, oh my gosh, she just sang that whole Mary Poppins song on stage. You know, that pride and and feeling inside is actually a little bit bigger than the feeling from the activities, even though it's a little different and you don't get your coping from it, but like that makes it worth it, seeing them you know, have a, a special time in something and filling their cup fills your yeah. cup immediately. Yeah. So it's pretty special. I, I, I mean, you are like exuding radiant joy when you say that I can, I can see and feel that experience for you. Um, at, you mentioned Amelie and you like having sort of this agreement, like we'll, we'll take turns. We can trade off. So we each get our time. A, have you been able to uphold that? And then B, like, what's that dynamic been like between the two of you? And how's that changed over the last year? <laughs> yeah, obviously another huge change. Like, yes, we've stuck to that. It's been like Amelie went back to work and I stayed home. Okay. So for her, it's been a little bit different because she comes home from work and then her activity is baseball. So mm-hmm. like, that's easy. It's a set time. She goes out and does it and comes home. I have found it a little bit more difficult to peel myself away because I feel guilty I feel Mm. like you know I I shouldn't leave the you know just like toss the kids to her and leave for two hours but at the same time when I do I'm like 
I shouldn't feel bad about this. Yeah. Like it's okay, but it's. I think it's just my nature as yeah, well. Yeah, interesting. Even though you've been yeah. there the whole entire day, right? Yeah, and like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm ready for that run, but it's hard yeah. to get out there. Mm. Um, but she's been good at being like, no, mm, go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please go. Yeah, and and learning to parent together like has it I mean how long how long were the two of you together before you adopted the kids <sighs> since toy I'm looking at my little art piece back here mm -hmm. for dates uh 2018 okay <laughs> so okay so a while now several years and has has it been easy parenting with her has it have there been butting head moments has it been both what my goodness, this wife of mine, I can't believe we found each other in life. I'm so happy because we have, on all those years, never butt heads on anything. We just very, knock on all the wood, easily <laughs> go through our life together. So switching to this extremely dynamic parenting role yeah. immediately was not hard. Um, with her, she is probably the only person I could have done this with. And, you know, other than the fact that we are now, you know, a bit of spouses in passing, cause like it's so yeah. busy in the household yeah. and our alone time is from, you know, eight till nine at night. Like it's yeah. like, it's it, that part has changed for sure. But you know, the connection, you still feel it. So that's, I think what's important to hold really true. Mm. Um, because it's so easy to get just caught up in that tidal wave of life and kids and yeah. schedules and, you know, problems yeah. that you're dealing with. And so with her, it's been not hard, completely amazing. We have a very interesting, uh, like, parenting style. Like, she is kind of more of, like, the you know, stern talker if they need to, like the dad role. She's got the eyebrows in play. <laughs> <laughs> and I like try, like we kind of each have our role without mm. even trying yeah. that works just so well in tandem that it's, yeah, she's amazing. Wow. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I want to like appreciate the fact that we're obviously, you know, having a one hour glimpse of what life is like with these soon to be three kids, which I want to talk about in a moment. Um, and, and you have three kids in the home right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I mean, I just feel like these and I know I promised I wouldn't say this, but like what a gift for these children to come into the home with you and Amelie and that like it, it all feels like things are unfolding in that perfect way for all of you. And it's just such a beautiful thing to see. And I, I mean, I just think, wow, amazing because sure, what you're doing is not for everyone, but it's for you and it's for these children and it's just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very, very like strongly about your story. I hope everyone, I, I'm sure everyone will be very moved to hear about all of this. Um, it, this is, and, and today, by the way, like this is our first adoption story, which I'm sorry it's taken so long, but we certainly would love to, we'll love to have more. Um, okay. Tell us so that we haven't talked too much about it. We've alluded to it a few times, but we have a third child, a third sibling who is now in the family. And so had you known from the get go, there would be three siblings. You mentioned wanting three or four four kids? Yeah, three. Three, <laughs> three now plus, you're good. plus or minus. Oh, yeah, we're good. <laughs> no, it was interesting because right on our contract that we signed after mm -hmm. we got those big binders, um, it had him in there that mm -hmm. in order to adopt the twins, you had to be willing to, you know, think about accepting the third child if he went into permanent care. So we were elated. We were like, yeah, we, you know, you have to, like, I have to say this cautiously because I don't want, you know, like that poor birth mother. I, I honestly can't understand how she must have felt losing all her children. But at the same time, when we saw there could be a potential third sibling, we were like, oh, we really hope this can come to play because that would just cap off what we wanted 
perfectly, perfectly, exactly yeah. what we were looking for. And so we knew about him, and so there were uh, visits that we had to do as part of our contract for adopting the twins with him. So we went up to his hometown mm -hmm. and visited with him and his foster home every month um, up until a few months ago when he actually started transitioning down here. Um, his court date was pushed and pushed and pushed, so that took a long time for him to go into permanent care. Yeah, it's, it's a very different trajectory than the twins. The twins were in care right from the get-go mm -hmm. and never lived with any biological family members, mm -hmm. whereas this little guy lived with bio mom and bio grandma, got removed at eight months um, under dire circumstances, and then bounced back and forth a couple times through his three years. So... It's different for him, for sure, and there's a lot of risk, like pushback on him getting adopted to us, even though it was part of our contract. Like, it's just so yeah. interesting. So here we are. He moved in on the 28th of August, and um, we're apparently going to foster to adopt, but there's just so much gray area that... I hope it doesn't get muddied up. Like, I hope we can adopt him and he doesn't get sent back. It would be really sad if that happened, but yeah. we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we don't need to talk about all the specifics of the circumstances with these three kids, you know, as far as the bio family and specifically your, your third son, but you know, not just obviously the hope for you that you'll be able to have this third sibling, but really from what, what I understand, I'm sure there's just a lot of sadness to think that he could end up in this very difficult un, you know, unsafe, di yeah, yeah, challenging situation. It's, it must be immensely painful to see. And, and then to know, yeah. That and like, it's funny. I know we spoke of it in our last conversation, yeah. but the whole like gay piece. So we hadn't really. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Can we talk we about had, it? The gay yeah, piece? Yeah, <laughs> let me bring it to the table. <laughs> Thank, it's Thanks, here, Liz. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. It's like, you know, it was the first time in this whole experience that it was in our face, the fact that we were gay. You know, the birth family member didn't want him to be adopted to us, wanted him to be raised in a traditional Christian household was with values. Or I can't. I mean, you don't have to specify. No, that's okay. But yeah. somebody, somebody in the biological family did not yes. want this. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I appreciate it. Let's who, keep some yeah. protection around these individuals, <laughs> yeah. of course. And, and someone yourselves. who has a lot of pull, unfortunately. So, so, yeah, that part has been interesting. But, you know, we are who we are. And we're very, you know, loving and honest and open people. And, you know, it's been tricky. The gay thing has been tricky. And, and like we can talk about kind of my feelings about it because it has shaped, you know, my thinking and more so around the rhetoric that's been cropping up over the past couple of years of, you know, that unfounded fear of transgendered people and the gay community grooming children to be gay or, you know, forcefully setting them through surgeries, you know, without their parents' consent, like all these wow notions. Anyways, they've bled. They've bled through the whole rainbow for sure. And we, Amelie um, and I, sit at the most privileged point in that rainbow. Gay women are just like not really persecuted like maybe gay men or tra like I I've yeah. never had hardship, you know, thankfully in my life because it's easy for me just to walk through life being straight like no one really would know I won't say it you know it's not obvious so now with kids it's like with this whole bleed through of this horrible rhetoric it it you know sadly makes you second guess you know what you can do with your children because you know for me Amelie doesn't feel the same as me she's much stronger in her will and caring not caring about what other people think but me I I do care and and I want to raise my children in the best way possible and and you know have it shown and so it would be devastating you know for me to be labeled a groomer because I've put my child in a rainbow shirt 
or, you know, like something as simple as that, you know, like for anybody who knows a gay person or is a gay person or has, you know, is in that continuum, you know, you can choose whichever way at whichever time, like it's not something that can be forced, you know, so it's such a silly thing to think that you can, you know, condition someone to be gay or straight. It just, your soul knows. Your soul knows, and it is a baseline yuck or yes. <laughs> like, there's no <laughs> getting around that. Yeah. And so for me, it's, I just can't understand how that has become so prevalent in people's thinking. But yet at the same time, I still concede. I still concede to the fact that, you know, I probably won't dress my children in rainbows until they have a voice for themselves and know what the rainbow means and blah, blah, blah. It's a weird thing. It's, I, I mean, I can only say that I'm sorry this even has to be a conversation like it, that. I, I really appreciate you giving voice to this. And I, you know, there's, I don't want to say some irony because of course you've had to deal with the realities of your identity for your entire life. And yet just a few weeks ago, I remember I brought up this question of being a same sex couple. Do you think it's impacted this process? And you were sort of like, yeah, maybe in a couple of occasions. And we, we talked a little bit about, you know, you gave the example with like putting your child in a rainbow shirt, but I'm really sorry that it's come to the forefront and, you know, could potentially impede with the adoption of your third child. And that it's, it's a factor for people when, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it it, sh it shouldn't be. And uh, like, God, all we want is for children to have loving parents or individual parent. And yeah, I don't want to say who cares about the rest. It's obviously, it, it's, it's, it's important. I don't want to like dismiss um, who you love, but I just, that it has to be part of the discussion for, yeah. 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 Others. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not speaking eloquently, but Liz, thank you. Of course. Okay. <laughs> of course. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Where do I want to go from here before we wrap up? I guess what I would love to know is what, well, let me, okay. Before we do that, if somebody is thinking about adopting a child or children, what do you think is a question or some questions or considerations they need to be asking or making? Yeah. So it depends which route you're willing to go or you want to go. Uh, but honestly, if you do do public adoption, you do have to ask yourself those hard questions of, you know, how will, how would you feel if you got a child with high needs or a very behavioral child? Because, you know, sadly, a lot of those kids have struggled in their life already just yeah. with how they've been brought into this world. So yeah. it takes time to reroot, you know, behaviors and give a more stable place for any change to happen. So that is, you really have to be true to yourself there for sure and then privately you know you know you're looking at a lot of money so if you're willing to to spend a lot of money you're regardless adoption will give you an amazing outcome whatever it looks like if you go through it you want it like there's no way someone would go through all these years of all the hurdles and then be like you know not for me like mm. that that is those are the people that want it are the yeah. ones that hold steady. So if you've asked yourself those questions and you've gone through all these steps, rest assured, it will unfold how you want it to eventually with hardships for sure, because transition in general, no matter if you get the best kid with zero issues, it's going to be hard. These poor children, like you said, don't know who their parents are. They don't have them. And how odd when you're going to preschool doing family trees, like I've seen it with my kids already, all the stuff that came with them when they moved in. I have three for three blank family trees from preschools because, you know, what do you, who, who do you put where? What do you put where? And oh, let's just tuck it in the backpack. So, you know, there's a transition there that is yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. But it is an incredible thing to do and there are so many kids out there that just need somebody they just need somebody to step up and and try just try yeah beautiful advice i'd love to hear what has been the biggest joy in coming into motherhood what have you loved most so far ah uh, 
the cuddles. No. Honestly, <laughs> honestly. Because, like, you know, with all my years working, like, sure, I've hugged a kid, like, even though you're not supposed to, but being allowed and, like, and, 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 ugh, it's like really getting deep in there has been my best, best, best moments by far. And, and so, like, natural, you know, and it, it's just, it fills you. It fills you immediately, right to all your heart cockles. You know, Aww. it's just this <laughs> most special thing. And yeah. so I'd say that's like my biggest love so far. But I don't know, just the future. Like yeah. the future has so much possibility for these kids. And, and I'm just like so overly excited to like, within reason give them everything to yeah. see what they can do and what they yeah. love and where their passions lie especially Aries because he can't talk and he's not going to tell you but you watch him and you're like wow you're very mechanically inclined like where's that gonna take you little one like nobody yeah. knows and it's just the sky is the limit which is like for me as a parent is so exciting and and I can't wait for the years to unfold to see, you know, how these kids kind of unfold on their own into their little bouquet of flowers. <laughs> I, adoption sounds like it's been just an incredible gift for you, Amelie, and for the three kids. So um, you know, I can only wish you luck with the, the continuation of this process with getting the I's dotted, the T's crossed, and hopefully, you know, having your, your third child confidently securely in your home so yeah thanks okay liz before we wrap up i have five rapid fire questions <laughs> I ask I all my were, guests yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i'm gonna i'm gonna put a little spin on them because of this are being our first adoption story so the the first two are finished this sentence the first one is being an adoptive mom is or a mom through adoption perhaps would be the better term fulfilling being a mom by adoption is not easy what is one tool or resource that you think might help people who are considering adoption to make this decision you know i think the best resource would be reaching out to someone who's gone through it themselves because it'll be hard to get straightforward information from any sort of government website yeah. <laughs> um and you know, everybody's experience is so different that I feel like if you can put a personal connection, you might learn a lot and then have some value to your own story as well. I, I'd say that's probably it, but there's a lot of resources out there, um, a lot of groups that, mm -hmm. you know, you can join in um, and it's all adoptive parents that may be waiting to adopt or have adopted yeah. or maybe adopted 10 years ago. So it's like you get all realms. We never kind of join those groups, but they're out there and they're very valuable. So like all those tools would yeah. be useful. Okay. Amazing. Uh, what is one thing that you would like child free by choice people to know? There's no bad answer there. Whether you choose to have children or you choose not to, like it's both are great paths with amazing opportunities. Right. And it's just so different that they can't yeah. be compared. <laughs> totally. Yes. Yes. But Wise honestly, words. yeah, like the whole notion of having kids because I'm a woman and I have to, that should never be the reason you have children ever, 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 because you will not get out what you want ever in that situation. So if you don't have the desire, you should not do it. But, you know, even that inkling, if you got an inkling like I did for many of those years, <laughs> you know, go through with it. It is, it is an amazing process and experience um, for your own self, right? Yeah. And, and especially adoption because you go from zero to hero within a day. <laughs> Like, yeah. it's just like, oh, okay, now it's not this baby that I'm coddling and feeding. It is this child that is talking to me that I have to figure out, oh, what's your personality like or right two. off the bat? In your case. Yeah, yeah. And like <laughs> really figure it out. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that would be my answer there. All right. Okay. And lastly, if you could give one piece of advice to someone who's currently on the fence about whether or not to have kids, what would that advice be? Hmm. 
you know, that's a tricky one because I'd say right off the cuff, like, you know, get one of your friend's kids over and like see, but it's not the same. It is yeah. not the same at all. And you can't compare those experiences either. So I, I don't know. I, sit on the fence. Sit on the fence for as long as you need to because the fence isn't a bad place to be. You're considering. You know, you're, you're on the fence for a reason. You're not done figuring it out yet. So just sit tight. Sit tight. Ponder. You'll figure it out. Oh, my God. I love it. Nobody has ever said just sit on the fence, hang out. I am here for it. That is awesome, Liz. Okay, that's a perfect way to to wrap things up. Thank you so much for having this conversation wow. to me. Um, it means a lot to me, and I know it definitely will mean a lot to our listeners. So thank you very much. Of course, and thanks again. It was a great chat. I loved it. Thank you for tuning in for this latest episode of the Kids or Child Free Podcast. I hope you found that conversation insightful and valuable. And if you did, I have a special request to make. And that is, I would be so appreciative if you would go leave a review or a rating over on Apple Podcasts or leave us a rating on Spotify, both of which can be done via the Apple Podcasts and the Spotify apps on your mobile device. If you go do that, that is going to be a huge help in helping the Kids Are Child Free podcast get discovered by more listeners, more people like you who are on the fence seeking clarity with this decision. So hop on over. I mean, if you're listening on your device, you're probably there right now. It'll quite literally take you anywhere from like 10 to 20 seconds. Leave us a rating. Again, you can do that on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Or if you're on the Apple Podcast app, you can also leave us a review with some kind words sharing what you think about this podcast and why you suggest other fence sitters should tune in. Thank you in advance for doing so, and I wish you a beautiful rest of your day.